this is mostly meant as kind of a, a background or to give you a foundation of information about how to think about carbon taxes. So I want to give you a, a kind of a framework, a conceptual framework that will let you think about carbon taxes and evaluate propositions that you might hear, including the one that I'm going to give you at the end of the presentation for what I think we ought to consider going forward with in Colorado. <clears throat> and I think we all know why this is important right now. Um, if anybody doesn't know why 400 is a big number these days, we just for the first time crossed on a daily average basis 400 parts per million CO2. But all indications are that we are going to blow right by 500 within the lifetime, within the lifetime of you know, people in the room. <clears throat> you know, this is something like 40, 50 years away. And the last time that we had that much CO2 in the atmosphere was more like 50 million years ago during the Paleocene. So basically, in the, the period of geologic history that came after the dinosaurs got wiped out, that was the last time that the, the global climate looked anything like what the plan of record is today. Carbon pricing is one of many tools that we must wield, or that we have the uh, ability to wield, in the building of those other futures. <clears throat> But like all tools, you have to use it correctly. <laughs> so I think the new plan should be carbon zero. And you know, I don't have a date attached to that, because the truth is it's approximately zero, approximately now, is what we need to be aiming for. And we're not going to get that. But today we have the, the, pot, the potential to build a, a zero or extremely low carbon civilization, which really doesn't sacrifice uh, a high quality of life. So while it's, it's not easy, this is not this is not a trivial task by any stretch, but I think it's actually one of the easiest futures to live in. Um, because if you look at the, the forecasts for doing nothing, which is really doing something quite extreme for the next you know, several decades, centuries, dealing with you know, inundated coastal cities and uh, the loss of the ice caps and far more extreme weather than we've ever had to live with, and you know, crop failures globally, th those are not easy things to deal with either. So we have a choice of which challenging thing we want to deal with, and I think you know taking the carbon emissions down drastically is, is really um, roughly the, the easiest option that we actually have on the table, and it's a fantasy that there's some you know do nothing option that that is easy. There, there aren't any easy options here, and in, in that context, I, I really I want to stress that cynicism is obedience in this context. If you just throw up your hands and say, oh, it's too hard, we can't do it. You know, honestly, that's exactly what Rex Tillerson and all the other fossil fuel CEOs want you to do. That is the best possible outcome for them. So this is a brief outline. That's kind of the justification for why we'd even like to think about this. But um, just to give you the kind of takeaways up front, carbon pricing is indirect, and it is very market reliant. <clears throat> Alone, it can only work well if the markets work well, and you get a significant price signal. Um, that's carbon pricing in general is kind of it, it very much buys into the market ideology of our day that you know if you if you incorporate these prices well, then the market will take care of things. But it turns out markets, and especially energy markets, aren't particularly efficient. There are a lot of market failures. Uh, in addition to that. The, the price signal that will result from the types of carbon prices that people usually discuss are very small, and we'll, we'll look at that in detail. <clears throat> Revenue neutral carbon pricing schemes, uh, which have gotten a lot of press in the last year, but it's a big concession, and you need to be aware of that in any kind of political negotiation around this. <clears throat> In, in that vein, what you spend the revenue on is very important. You know, it is potentially as important or more important than where the revenue comes from um, and the price signal that results from the fee being imposed. And I think we should spend it on profitable, first, energy efficiency financing. So there's a lot of energy efficiency out there that has negative cost. Um, that, that means it saves you money, and there are market failures that prevent it from being taken advantage of today. We need to fix that. Uh, and then a robust and stable renewable energy market where people, businesses can plan long term around renewable energy prices that they can make some reasonable return on along the same lines as the uh, re quote unquote reasonable return that Excel makes on their capital investments. <clears throat> There's another kind of revenue neutrality that's possible uh, if, if we make these investments. You don't have to take the money for the carbon and give it to something else. Uh, 
when you, or you, you do that, but the money doesn't disappear, right? It keeps circulating around. If you use it to displace corporate income taxes, then the shareholders are basically getting it. If you use it to invest in energy efficiency and renewable energy finance, yeah, you've paid something for that carbon, but ultimately, in the economy as a whole, it will save you money, it makes the economy more efficient, and it stabilizes long-term energy prices. So when people start ranting about how this is too expensive, you know, as people are with uh, Senate Bill 252, oh, it's going to destroy our economy, it's bad for rural Colorado, that's because they're only looking at the, the, the sticker on the front. You, you know, you, they don't see the economy-wide impacts of changing the type of energy system we have. And I think in a global context, we can do this for, for free, on average, maybe even making us money and certainly giving us much better stability going forward. <clears throat> so another, another debate that comes up a lot here is markets versus regular. What's the right way to do this? Should we, should we let the market fix it or should we have like, the government intervene and try and fix things? And I think that's baloney, that's a, that's a false dichotomy because all markets are actually a product of a regulatory environment. It's just a matter of who is doing the regulation and to what ends. And left to their own devices, many Unregulated markets end up being monopolies that are regulated by the monopolist for their own uh, profit motive. And I don't think that's the, the kind of market that we want here. Like I said before, pricing carbon is an indirect policy. So it presumes that there's some system between you imposing that cost and people making decisions that actually end up emitting carbon. There's some system in there that functions <clears throat> and that the price signal is gonna make it all the way through to that decision maker. Uh, so it doesn't pursue directly the desired outcomes, which are reductions in emissions. <clears throat> so is this presumption true? Is it, is it true that there's a, a good market mechanism that will take these prices and get them to the decision makers? And I think that in many cases, it is not true. And you can't really read everything on here, and that's fine, because that's, that's not the point of this slide. Basically, the stuff on the left, this is from a, a study done by McKinsey Consulting. And they've redone it several times, and they've done it for different countries and for corporations and other you know, kind of entities that might care about their energy efficiency. And what it shows is the, the carbon cost um, equivalent of abating emissions. So on the left, stuff that's below the zero line, that's a bunch of stuff that saves you money if you don't emit the carbon. And that's mostly energy efficiency measures. The stuff on the right is stuff that costs you money to avoid emitting carbon. And you'll notice that this triangle and that triangle, they're about the same area, which means if you do everything on here, you end up not spending any money overall. <coughs> That's not to say that this wouldn't be a big transition and that you wouldn't have to spend some money in the process. You would spend a lot of money and there would be winners and losers in that process. And the losers are going to be the incumbent energy industries and they're gonna fight tooth and nail to keep you from making these investments no matter how much sense they might make for you or for the economy as a whole. <clears throat> this is another, uh, this is from the uh, American Council for an Energy Efficiency Economy, or Energy Efficient Economy, looking at the uh, average return on investment versus the year-to-year -year volatility in returns for a variety of places you could put your money. Energy efficiency can give you, you know, 20 or more percent return at very, very low risk. And there's, there, there are literally billions of dollars worth of investments that can, can be made and get these returns. So why aren't people doing it? This market and many others are broken. And this is just a few of the ways in which our energy markets, especially in the realm of efficiency, are broken. One is split incentives. That's, you know, the landlord has say over, you know, building upgrades, whether they're gonna insulate the walls or upgrade your furnace or that kind of stuff. But you, the tenant, whether it's residential or commercial, you're the one that pays the energy bills. So why the hell would the landlord make those upgrades? They don't care. They don't get anything out of it. Um, imperfect information, if you're looking to buy a house or, or rent a, a commercial space, it's really hard to find out what the energy use of that, that space is. Um, so people are making decisions in the absence of good information. The corporate income tax code is totally screwed up in this realm because operating expenses, you know, the energy bill that you pay every month is completely tax deductible. But capital investments that you make up front to avoid spending money on future energy um, that depreciates sometimes over as much as 40 years. So you don't get to capture that tax benefit. And that can, that can uh, put efficiency investments at as much as a 25 or 30% disadvantage relative to um, just paying the higher energy costs. 
There are huge sunk cost problems. Uh, in Colorado, we've just recently built a coal plant, which you know is worth about a billion dollars, and unless we're crazy, we will shut it down long before its useful lifetime has uh, expired. And somebody's got to eat that. Somebody has to eat that sunk cost. And who's it going to be? Is it going to be us? Is it going to be Excel's shareholders? Is it going to be the taxpayers statewide? Um, that's really the negotiation that we're having here on a very large scale is who is going to eat a bunch of these assets that actually it's hazardous to operate. <clears throat> Access to capital is a problem for both renewable energy and energy efficiency. Uh, master limited partnerships, uh, a very tax efficient um, financing mechanism for uh, the fossil fuel industry, it's not available for renewable energy. And there are, there are a lot of other people have trouble quantifying energy efficiency benefits. You know, how much money am I going to get from this actually? And there's, there's ways to do it. Like I'm, I'm going to invest a million dollars in this and it's going to pay a 7% dividend for the next 30 years. But you can't go out and get financing at the, the drop of a hat for that kind of investment the way you can for many other investments. <clears throat> Our utility regulation system has a lot of poor incentives. You know, even in markets like California and in parts of the Northeast where utilities don't just make money from selling more kilowatt hours, um, really it's, it's extraordinarily rare for efficiency to have been made a, a profit center for the utility, where that's like the thing they go nuts over. It's like, how can we make this more efficient? That's, that's just not what they do. And then the one that everybody on the green end of things likes to talk about is the externalized costs. And they are huge. We all know they're gigantic. Um, <clears throat> but if you decide that the social cost of carbon is $20 a ton or $200 a ton or whatever, whatever price you decide your calculation reveals, and then you create a tax or a fee or a trading scheme or whatever that implements that, that cost, you're not done. You can't walk away and say, well, we've, we've internalized the externalized cost. It, the market will take care of it now. Everything's good. Because of all of these other market failures, which you have to actually go fix. If you want that cost to propagate through the economy and transform the economy, you have to do the hard work of fixing all these dirty details. And it is going to be a pain in the ass, because a lot of these, these detailed regulations are actually made at the, the local and the, the county and you know some of them at the state level. But you know, building codes for one are, you know, there's thousands of jurisdictions that, that maintain building codes in the US. <clears throat> and they all have to be fixed. So assume you've done that. Assume that you've you've fixed the markets and they're relatively efficient now. <clears throat> How big a price signal can you get through to the people making decisions about energy use? And is that going to be large enough to transform the economy? Or to put it another way, what carbon price would be required to really show up where everybody notices, oh my god, you know, the car that I run on solar electrons is so much cheaper than the car that I run on, you know, hexane from petroleum. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it turns out that, um, well, so okay, the variable we're going to use to look at that is uh, what I'm calling the carbon price sensitivity. And that is, for, for a small carbon price, say a dollar a ton, how big is the change that you get to see uh, at the end user's level on, in that fuel? <clears throat> Let's see here. <clears throat> what it really measures is the, the cost of a fuel relative to its carbon content. So there's two variables. There's how much carbon does it have, and also how much does it cost on the market today? And then we can compare that to the fluctuations that we've seen recently in those prices. So, you know, if you want to look at gas prices fluctuating two or three dollars a gallon over the last ten years, um, how does that compare to the price signal that you'd be passing through with a dollar a ton, or you know, later twenty-five dollars a ton, some other amount, um, some putative carbon tax rate? <clears throat> and if you just want some easy rules of thumb that maybe you might possibly remember after the talk, a dollar a ton is a penny a gallon. So every dollar a ton you charge costs about a penny per gallon of gasoline. It should be a tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour, given Colorado's prices and uh, fuel mix. And it's about a nickel per thousand cubic feet of natural gas, which is a, a billion unit you'll see sometimes. <clears throat> so you know, if you, if you want to know just off the top of your head, uh, is this carbon tax somebody's talking about, is that going to show up on my gas bill? You know, if you remember these numbers, you might have some chance of uh, differentiating between serious and less serious options. So this chart, this shows the price sensitivity and the amount of carbon emitted uh, by, by several fuels. On the left is gasoline. Uh, and the left bar, the red, is the percentage change in gasoline's price that results from a $1 a ton carbon cost. And as you can see, 
is very small. So it's about a quarter of a percent. For natural gas, domestic natural gas, it's a little more. It's maybe two thirds of a, a percent. For electricity overall, it's uh, getting closer to 1%. It's like 0.9%. For the natural gas that goes into generating electricity, the utilities get a much better deal than we do on natural gas. <clears throat> uh, it's a little bit more than a percent. And then the giant red bar on the right is coal. So coal, by far, has the largest price sensitivity to a carbon tax. It's anywhere between you know, five times larger than the natural gas price sensitivity or 20 times larger than gasoline. So it is easily the, the lowest hanging fruit with respect to a carbon tax. And there's a caveat here, which is the, the fugitive emissions from natural gas development, uh, which can be game changing. And once we figure out really what those look like, um, this could be a different picture. It could be that both natural gas and uh, coal are very sensitive if we take fugitive methane emissions into account. But at least on the face of it, the easiest fuel to influence with a carbon tax or a carbon price of any kind is coal. Now the black bars are, in Colorado, how many millions of tons of CO2 we emit from each of those fuels each year. Um, petroleum products are about 40 million tons. Uh, natural gas uh, used domestically is about uh, 20 million tons. It, the electricity system as a whole is about 40 million tons. Natural gas for electricity is, I, I was surprised to see that this is small, it's only about 5 million tons. And then coal is about 35 million tons. So coal here has a combination that's really golden for our purposes, which is it's a lot of emissions and it's sensitive to a price. So if you're gonna see something really impacted by a carbon price, as far as the price signal goes, the first thing to go down is gonna be coal. <clears throat> so another way we can look at this is what carbon price would it take to double the cost of a fuel. So if you want to double the cost of gasoline with a carbon tax, you've got to charge $400 a ton. <clears throat> uh, if you want to double the price of natural gas for domestic use, it's about $150 a ton. If you want to double the price of electricity overall, it's about $110, $112 a ton. Uh, natural gas for electricity generation is about $90 a ton. And coal, if you, if you charge $20 a ton for carbon emissions, that will double the price of coal. So again, this is just another way of looking at the, the relative sensitivity of these different fuels to uh, a carbon tax. So what does that mean for coal? It, you know, it's by far the easiest price signal to get through. It's a very significant emission source. Um, and even a low carbon price, a carbon price that nobody's going to notice anywhere else, uh, can potentially be a coal killer. However, you know, this market's broken too. And given the current arrangement uh, regulatorily in Colorado, we could implement a carbon cost and they'd be like, meh, all right, well, I guess we just passed that through. And um, we need to change that so that the utility eats those fuel costs, or we need to allow existing generation, stuff that's already been built, um, to ha we need to force it to compete with new resources. So if you already have a coal plant and somebody's like, you know what, I'm going to build a wind farm and if I come in cheaper, you're shutting down, the PUC would have to enforce that kind of decision. And that's not the way things are right now. So um, if we implement a carbon cost or a carbon price, if we want it to actually impact coal buying decisions in the state, we have to change the way those, those costs are passed through. Um, so the, the decision maker, this is another split incentive, the decision maker, which is the utility, is also the one that stands to you know, benefit or feel the pain um, based on the, the carbon intensity of their decisions. For other fuels, um, I think it's unlikely, at least in the short term, that we'll be able to implement a carbon price that people really notice in gasoline. And similarly for natural gas, and I, you know, I feel kind of two ways about this. I feel like, well, that's, that's actually, that's great because we could get it in and nobody would notice. At the same time, if nobody notices, it's not gonna transform the economy. You know, it's not gonna change what anybody's doing. Um, and again, there's the giant caveat here um, that fugitive methane might make natural gas actually quite sensitive to, um, to a, even a modest carbon price. So with that in mind, I want, I want to talk about two different ways that you can think about a carbon price. So, so far we've just been thinking about a carbon price as, as a market mechanism. You know, you, you put a price there, hand it over to the market, let the market do its thing, the invisible hand comes in and changes people's minds. Um, but you can think about it as a, a funding mechanism as well, as a revenue generator. And this is actually, this is the way our cap tax works in Boulder. Um, 
we take the money that's raised by that carbon tax and we spend it on stuff. And we spend it primarily on mitigation of emissions, on energy efficiency and renewables. And this has some big benefits from the point of view of reducing emissions. Um, first, it's really easy to measure the effects of those types of investments compared to measuring the effects of a price propagating through your economy. And basically, nobody does that. When you, you know, build a bunch of wind farms or put solar panels on your roofs or you know, change the energy use of a bunch of buildings in your city or replace all the motors and pumps in your industrial plant with things that are 10 times more efficient, which is sometimes totally possible, um, you can measure those effects. So you have some way of telling, is it working? And how well is it working? And how expensive is it? And are we screwing this up? Do we need to change the program? That kind of stuff. So all right, I want to talk about the, the siren call of revenue neutrality now. So AEI and, and some other kind of conservative think tanky groups have recently been kind of putting it out there that uh, maybe we could, we could get on board with a, a revenue neutral uh, carbon price, maybe, especially if we used it to get rid of the corporate income tax. Wouldn't that be sweet? <clears throat> um, but that's regressive, and most of the proposals that are put out by uh, the conservative end of the spectrum re regarding carbon pricing are quite regressive. Both displacing the income tax and especially corporate income tax, um, that increases the tax burden on the low end of the income spectrum and decreases it on the upper end of the income spectrum. And you know that is that's a separate issue in you know, a lot of ways from the, the climate issue, but it's something that a lot of people that like the climate issue are also not likely to be thrilled about. It also makes carbon pricing an entirely market endeavor. So if you say, I'm not gonna do anything with the money I raised, I'm just gonna give it back to the corporations, or even if I'm just gonna dividend it back to the public, um, you're really, you're entirely relying on the market to get the job done. And as we saw above, the price signals at modest carbon prices are really, they're not very big. And uh, expecting that the market is just gonna take care of it with a small price signal, um, even if you fix the markets, which is itself a large task, I think is, is naive. So when you go into any kind of negotiation like this, you have to recognize that giving away those revenues to whatever is actually a very, a very large concession. So don't do it lightly. And then, does it really buy political support? Is it, are they gonna get on board or is it just kind of one of these, these dangling um, you know, lures like, oh, come talk to us, waste some time, ha ha ha, we're not gonna do anything. <clears throat> and can it actually be useful budget-wise? You know, so the things that they talk about is like, oh, we could displace uh, the budget deficit or maybe we don't need the income tax anymore or you know, these things that they, they don't like and wanna get rid of and think that they can use um, carbon tax revenues to get rid of, does that really work? Well, you can look at how much CO2 the, the whole country emits, just for example. The US puts out about 7 billion tons, 7 gigatons of carbon dioxide every year. And the, the total federal tax revenue is about uh, $2,100 billion per year. And that breaks up, as you might be able to see in the pie chart, about $900 billion of that is individual income taxes, $865 billion of it is payroll taxes, uh, a little less than $200 billion is corporate income taxes. And the, the projected budget deficit, just for scale, in 2013 is about $650 billion. And you can ask, well, OK, say we wanted to fix the deficit. How much would we have to charge per ton of carbon emitted? And um, it's about $90 a ton. You want to you get rid of that $650 billion deficit? That's $90 a ton for every single ton of carbon emitted in the United States, from electricity generation, agriculture, cars, everywhere. Uh, if you want to displace the entire uh, tax base with carbon taxes, that's, that's like $300 a ton. <coughs> and okay, you know, maybe you say, sure, I'd, I'd rather tax this thing that I don't want um, than, you know, taxing payroll or taxing income or capital gains or whatever. It sounds better. But you have to remember that a carbon tax is, it's a punitive tax. You're taxing a thing that you want less of. And if it works, you will have less tax revenue. So it's actually, it's actually dangerous to go into this, um, you know, this game of trying to swap out other revenue sources for a carbon tax, because if it works, which you hope it will, you're gonna end up starving the government of funds and they're gonna have to you know, have new deficits or come up with new tax revenues. So it's really linking these revenues to mitigation programs is, is elegant because as you have less of the thing you don't want, you also have less work to do in getting rid of that thing you don't want. So they kind of digress together. 
So you might wonder what other countries have done in this, in this vein. Um, so this is several other jurisdictions that have carbon prices, uh, including Boulder. And they tend to be in the tens of dollars range. And I've listed here also what they do with the money. So British Columbia has a $30 a ton um, carbon tax that goes to displace other taxes. Uh, Finland has a $30 a ton tax that goes into the general fund and also does some tax displacement. Norway and Sweden both use it for general government funds. Denmark dividends some of it and spends some of it on mitigation. Um, the Netherlands uh, uses it to cut some other taxes and also on mitigation. We use it almost entirely on mitigation. And so you might be saying, well, all right, then you're saying they're doing it wrong. Um, are you really sure that they're doing it wrong? Why do you, why do you believe that? And they have a very different policy environment than we do. If you trust your government to raise taxes, to provide services, and to invest in you know, energy efficiency and other things that you want from the government, then you don't need this coupling of the revenues to the spending. The reason we are talking about you know, potentially linking the revenues to the spending is because we're afraid. We don't, we don't actually totally trust the legislature. We don't trust uh, Congress to just raise the money and then spend it on these very good investments in efficiency and renewables. You know, if you're in Germany, you don't worry about that. I mean, well, first of all, because their um, feed-in tariff is rate-based funded. But you know, in these other countries, you know, Sweden, Finland, they, they have very aggressive mitigation programs, and they just use general funds on it. They don't need this, this funding link. So just, just for scale, I want to talk about what, what could Colorado hypothetically do if we charged for example, $25 a ton. You know, and that's kind of in line with the, the, the carbon prices that um, a lot of the EU member states charge. And I'm going to look right now just on, just on charging it on electricity fuel. So on the natural gas and, and coal that goes into generating electricity. And there's about 40 million tons of CO2 from that at $25 um, a ton. That's about a billion dollars a year. And if you have a billion dollars a year, a year to spend on, for instance, wind and energy efficiency. Um, energy efficiency, uh, what, Seattle Light and Power actually just did a, um, a bidding process for energy efficiency uh, across the city. And it came in at about $30 a megawatt hour. So they're, they're bidding on um, how much does it cost to avoid using some energy. And obviously, this saturates at some point. You can't just forever get you know, endless amounts of efficiency at $30 a megawatt hour. But uh, you know, initially, there's a big pool of it available, and you can go after it. And that's about 33 terawatt hours of energy a year that could be saved. And that's roughly equivalent to the amount of energy that we get from all the coal-fired generation in Colorado today. So $25 a ton, a $1 billion a year, um, if that was spent cost effectively on energy efficiency, at least initially, you could displace potentially all of our, our uh, coal-based electricity. Wind costs more than the, the low-hanging energy efficiency fruits, um, about twice as much right now, uh, although those, those prices have been going down. Um, so if you spent the same billion dollars on a wind purchase agreement, you could displace half of the, the coal-fired generation uh, that we have in the system today. And what does that translate into uh, as far as a, a personal expense? You know, so that's a billion dollars a year with about five million people in the state. That's about $200 a year per person. And you know, that's not trivial. That's not, not nothing. But it is on the order of a pitcher of beer a month from the mountain sun. You know, and what we're talking about doing is you know, changing the structure of the economy and avoiding kind of a catastrophic climatic event. So you know, foregoing one pitcher of beer a month, I don't know. It, it's really not that, it's not a hard decision, at least from my point of view. But more importantly, um, it is revenue neutral in, in another way. So if you remember this chart from the beginning of the talk, um, you know, you add up the stuff below the line, the stuff above the line. Some of it has negative costs; it's savings. Some of it has positive costs; you have to spend. But overall, you know, it really does average out to roughly nothing. It, you're spending the money in a different place. You're 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 changing the energy system to be more efficient and more stable and use different energy sources. But in the grand scheme of things, you know, especially once the transition has taken place, it's not an intrinsically more expensive energy system. At least, you know, not in an obvious gigantic way. <clears throat> so I find it very frustrating when people rail against the kind of like, oh, the high cost, it's gonna be, you know, impossible for, for us to pay this or it's gonna destroy the economy. 
it, it really, I think, it's, it's close enough to a wash that it's unclear where we would come out after all of this. And it's a much more robust economy. And it's an economy that doesn't have to deal with coastal cities being inundated. It's an economy that doesn't have to deal with fluctuating fuel costs, rising fuel costs. You know, they're very well constrained fuel costs. It's also an economy that, you know, has a lot of local jobs that are dedicated to energy efficiency. About 1% of Germany's population is employed, almost a million people, employed doing building energy efficiency stuff, either on new build or retrofits of their enormous building stock. And, you know, that's substantial. That's, what would that be? That would be a couple thousand people in Boulder County, or a thousand people in Boulder, um, if done at that, that same scale. And the renewable generation side of things continues to get cheaper. Uh, you know, at some point it will bottom out, but there's no indication that we're reaching that point yet. Uh, and this is a logarithmic uh, scale on the, the vertical axis. So, you know, it's, it's really it's something like a, a a fixed percentage de decline in cost uh, per year, and this is for two different solar technologies. And uh, it's getting very close to crossing over really by any reasonable calculation uh, with, with fossil fuels when you do it in an efficient way. Uh, wind has a, a similar analogous curve that continues to fall. And it, there, were, there was a raft of, of articles in the New York Times and other, other major outlets uh, in the last couple of weeks talking about, uh, you know, kind of fear from the utilities that it's, you know, eventually this is, this is potentially utility destroying because you get this kind of, uh, you know, from our point of view, a virtuous cycle and from their point of view, a vicious cycle of, wow, well, you know, the electricity from my roof is now cheaper than the electricity from the grid, so I'll put some solar panels up and then I don't buy as much electricity. And then the cost recovery that they do to pay for all the wires and lines and linemen and other operating costs that don't have anything to do with generation directly, they have to charge more per kilowatt hour to cover those. And that just makes it cost effective for an even bigger pool of people to spend money to uh, you know, generate their own electricity. And you know, eventually you get to some new equilibrium far away where you're basically paying the grid to be your backup energy source. And, you know, that sounds fine, but that would be a very rough transition for uh, a lot of people. So I really want you to take away this, this idea of kind of an energy revenue neutrality. You know, if we do a good job, and we could, of course, do a bad job, but if we do a good job of spending the revenues from a carbon price on efficiency and cost-effective generation, we get both more localized um, energy systems, which means you're not just shipping away uh, money to the shareholders of Peabody or um, you know, other faraway lands. And you have local jobs that you know, implement much of the energy efficiency. <clears throat> and overall, once the, the economy is operating this way, it's more efficient, it's less subject to price fluctuations. It can, I think, end up being really cost neutral, even though you're going to see the cost in a different place. So, and, and people have trouble doing that kind of bookkeeping. But I think, I think really this is, this is the kind of revenue neutrality we should be going for. So my, my pitch, you know, what I think we should start from, is I think that we should price carbon uh, that's emitted from coal and natural gas in Colorado. Uh, I think we should start at about $5 a ton and let it go up from there. We need to change the fuel pass-through and existing versus new resource competition arrangement that the PUC has so that those price signals actually affect the decision makers um, choosing what kind of power to generate. We need to get on top of the fugitive methane emissions and figure out really how big that is. Is it a total deal breaker for natural gas? Um, you know, how, how does that make those fuels competitive with each other? Um, and how does it make them compare to renewables? And then we should use the revenues, and even $5 a ton, um, you know, that's for every $5 a ton, if you apply it just to the electricity sector, that's uh, on the order of $100, $100 million a year. We spend that to fund energy efficiency financing, and there are models for how to do this. The German Development Bank, KFW, which we ironically set up after World War II to rebuild Germany, now uh, administers hundreds of billions of euros worth of energy efficiency financing do uh, money. And you know, we can, in large part, you know, learn from them and copy the kinds of programs that they have that really make marginal efficiency improvements in buildings um, close to free for the people doing the improvements. And we can fund uh, renewable energy generation with something that resembles uh, a feed-in tariff or a standard offer contract. And both of these 
uh, mechanisms make investing in these things much more like a fixed income security. You know, you, you put the money in, you have some relatively guaranteed revenue stream that will be generated from it, and you don't have to worry about big fluctuations in either the returns or the costs. And we need to get to work fixing all of the, the local energy market inefficiencies and, and market failures that they keep a lot of this stuff from being done today, even when it already makes economic sense. Thanks.